Good morning. Uh, back again. Um, lovely autumnal, crisp morning. Uh, starting to feel the temperatures dropping, winter's coming. Um, all of the sports are starting up. So, uh, yeah, so it's a mixture of excitement, um, but also the, you know, the slight depression that it's going to start getting cold and miserable on Mud Island. Anyway, um, it's all poke pros and cons, isn't it? So, um, right, yeah, back, episode seven of Coach Education is Broken. Uh, and this one's entitled deconstructed delivery um, so uh, one of the things that I'm um, talking about is um, if we are shifting and transitioning and changing the way we think about coach education we probably need to think about uh, how coach education is delivered um, and break free, I think, from some of the existing delivery models um, so that we can, I don't know, offer something very different and in a very different way, which is, you know, genuinely what is often referred to as learner-centred. Learner-centredness is a phrase a little bit like child-centred in athlete or player development it's a sort of quite nebulous idea and um very rarely is it is it actually effectively implemented um however um let's say we want to go to a more learner centered model so what, what do we mean firstly by learner centered so um any system uh that you devise will um, ha or ca or can have elements within it that are more or less learner centered. So the ideal model um, for something to be truly learner centered would be to be something that is entirely and completely individualized. So any individual comes and they are, um, you know, they, they come at that sort of learning experience and everything is pretty much designed around them. Um, their, their, their needs in terms of their time, their access, uh, their previous uh, educational experiences, their um, approach to education and learning, um, what um, preferences they might have in terms of the, um, uh, the best model for them. Some people are more practical, some people are more theoretical, um, you know, and there's lots of debate about um, the different preferences people have around learning but like for example somebody who is dyslexic like my son um, has some dispensations presented to him um, when it comes to exams and you know kind of l l his learning experiences within school um, limited limited utility but at least there is something there if you go into special education for example what you'll then see is a massive disparate um, change of offer and and something that's delivered that doesn't look like formal education whatsoever you know in different um educational settings so for example a friend of mine runs a school that is designed specifically for children who have been excluded from mainstream education because of behavioral issues and their school would you wouldn't even recognize it as a school beyond the fact that it's a building and there are some people in there who are referred to as educators teachers it's designed very, very differently for these sorts of kids because they're just unable to operate in the hyper regimented landscape that is education or traditional education. Um, I say hyper regimented, you know, much more formal and structured um, uh, spaces. So uh, that's very much how uh, a learner centered model would work. You know, it would be very much, much more designed around the needs of the individual and and their preferences and as a result of that you you know you would design uh the experience uh from their needs upwards now the problem you've got is when you try to do that at scale it's one of the reasons that schools look like schools when you try to do that at, at scale it's extremely challenging because obviously it takes quite a bit of resources um 
and also if you try and do it um and so what you generally do is you know most educational systems are quite sort of mechanized and industrialized almost um they fe they feel very impersonal as a result of that you know so what what generally happens is you have quite a sort of um sort of regimented structured um model which is sort of designed around a sort of a median student uh, and and their needs and it's it's really designed and it, you know i think every nobody nobody would ever say that existing education systems are optimal um or you know really they're, they're they are as good as they can be given the limitations of resources etc 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 now i don't think that's necessarily true either by the way i think there's a lot could be done with education and there's a lot that is done within educational settings even even sort of you know kind of mass educational settings that are really really effective or much more effective um, than some of the more traditional approaches but they don't necessarily have they still haven't broken through into the mainstream because culturally resilient practice is very is culturally resilient for a reason right people don't necessarily break free from things and you know years and years and years of education policy run by politicians who aren't necessarily experts in education mean that you know you get you tend to get uh, education delivered in a very similar way and there's often just a bit of tinkering done i'm not going to get into the political landscape too much anyway so how do you so the challenge you've got is how do you do it at scale um and then so what has happened is because coach education, particularly in community space, is um, obviously, you know, you're dealing with large numbers, higher volumes. What's generally happened is that the educational models from mass uh, youth education um, are, have been sort of transferred into the coach education space, sort of. And, and then those are but the, and the ideas behind them of sort of industrialised notions of of education um, have then um, sort of permeated the coach education space. Some of that's to do with the nature of qualifications and what was expected of uh, an organisation, certainly in the UK, maybe not so much in different parts of the world, but what was expected by the educational department around what forms a qualification and what is required to achieve a qualification in terms of the delivery, which which is where you get your money from. And so the money, the, in, the income that you needed to actually run a qualification meant that you had to follow a qualification protocol. Um, now, that has changed, certainly in in the UK. Um, and not a lot of people know this necessarily. Um, and it was, ch it was changed because... Um, uh, a lot of organisations were unhappy about their coach education system. They didn't like it. They thought it was too restrictive um, and all that sort of stuff. So a review was done uh, at the beginning of um, my time. Well, I commissioned it myself in my time at Sport, Sport England. Um, where we reviewed our uh, coach qualification system, what was called the UK Coaching Certificate. And the outcome of that review was that we um, there was sort of general consensus that we needed to move beyond it to a new framework. And the framework that was created in the place of the UK Coach Certificate is a new suite of professional standards for coaching. And by the way, those professional standards are not just for coaching, they're for all forms of workforce, but includes the, work, the frontline workforce. So group exercise instructors, personal trainers, outdoor education instructors, swimming teachers, all under the, the, the umbrella of frontline workforce coaching. Um, so it's not just because so the only place you really had those qualifications frameworks uh, for coaching, you know, the UK coaching certificate was specifically for community sport. Didn't necessarily apply or, or wasn't transferable to the other parts of sport and physical activity. What professional standards do now is give much more transferability and much make it much easier for people to be recognised for their expertise across a range of different domains. So if somebody is a community sports coach and they say, I want to become a personal trainer, they've got an awful lot of the skills in place already through the education and training they've received about, around, around coaching, which they don't then necessarily need to redo when it comes to being doing a personal trainer. Again, people don't understand this. Um, I guess it hasn't necessarily been publicly communicated. It's sort of done on a quiet basis, one-to-one -one with different organisations. But even then, I still don't think people have necessarily seen the opportunities afforded by a much more flexible professional standards framework. Um, you know, those professional standards basically allow people to package together different roles. So like the, for the first time ever, the idea of a personal trainer uh, who say is working in a you know, community setting or a group exercise instructor is working in a community setting with, let's say, you know, a group of um, 
you know, kind of women with some long-term health conditions, um, they could pick up uh, a badminton qualification. Um, and it would be much easier for them to do so because of the skills that, that, uh, that they've got through their um, personal training qualification, which has been designed around this professional standard for being a personal trainer, and the fact that it's got an awful lot of things that map across to being a badminton coach. So really, all you need to do is develop the technical competencies, um, you know, and the, some of the specific elements of the sports activity, rather than having to redo all the learning about being a coach and starting from scratch. So that is a huge transformation, right? That's a huge opportunity for workforce development professionals to take on board and adopt. Um, if we can shift our mindset. Because a lot of the mindset at the moment is driven about the idea that, you know, if you've got a learner, you want that learner to be with you. Um, and most people say, oh no, you have to start from the bottom. You've got to learn our curriculum from the get-go. So you've got to, even if you're a high, you know, a, an advanced coach or an advanced practitioner in one domain, you have to start, and we assume that you're just a novice and you have to start with the level one and work your way up. Now, there are examples of organisations who are sort of flipping away from that a little bit, providing people with opportunities to progress quicker, particularly actually athletes, which is comes with some, some pros and cons to that. Um, the assumption being the actually athlete has a particular sense of knowledge about development that others don't. And that could be true. But it, again, that's difficult to identify. But anyway, there is an opportunity to do that now across community sport. So... And the, the opportunities for organisations to embrace this um, means that they could, their workforce could increase threefold, fourfold. And their ability to reach communities through their workforce by actually you know, embracing, for example, oh, you're a swimming teacher, you work in a leisure centre, here's your um, group exercise qualification that we can deliver for you in situ to make you able to deliver those qualifications whether you're in that environment that you're working in so more strings to your bow or badminton or botcher or whatever other activity it is that you're going to be doing fantastic opportunity to grow the reach of a sport and allow the sport to be experienced by far more people who might otherwise be marginalized from it um so this is exciting but what do we need in order to do this we have to think differently so all the stuff I've said, all the stuff I've said in the previous episodes um, around decentralisation, all that sort of that still stands. This all adds up together, by the way. These aren't individual. These are all these episodes are an aggregate of things that need to, would need to change. It's a lot. I get it. Um, but you know, it's not beyond our capabilities um, with a bit of imagination, creativity, resourcefulness. And the reason to do it is not just because it would make it better for the learners. It's also because it would absolutely be transformative in terms of. Um, the way a regenerative model around funding could come in. That's a future episode, regenerative funding. So we'll come to that, come to that in the future. I've got a lot to talk about that. I've got a lot to talk about technology, how basically, you know, resources are, are scarce. So how do we make sure that we can do a model of funding that um, actually makes it ch cheaper for the end user to access? So we lower the barriers to access but is actually generating a revenue to the training organisation so that they can then reinvest it in ongoing training, learning and development and make the experience better for the, for, for the, partic uh, for the practitioner. Stay tuned. More on that to come. And by the way, if you don't want to wait for my podcast, I'll more than happily talk to anybody uh, and, and, and provide some of these insights separately because I am a gun for hire now. Um, that's the plug over anyway. Um, so... Um, uh, just hit me up on LinkedIn, because it seems to be where everybody hits me up, which is great. Um, uh, so, uh, what else? Oh, yeah. So, going back to this notion of deconstructed delivery. Right, so, what we have to think about is, at the moment, what we tend to have is what I call packaged learning products. So, the vast majority of qualifications, this is certainly true of coaching, uh, and it's in the main true of most of the training offers that I've seen across the sport physical activity spectrum. But what we see is... Um, Generally speaking, these packaged learning products. So what do you do, right? Because it's ex the most expedient, efficient delivery mechanism. So an individual, time poor, will turn up for a weekend, two weekends, whoever it is, right? They will learn some stuff. They will get new knowledge. They'll be given an opportunity to apply that new knowledge, sort of then and there. And then they'll get an assessment as to how well they've taken on that new knowledge and applied it. Um, and that all will be done in a singular package. And that singular package at the end of that then is 
forms the basis of a certification or a qualification that that person then keeps it's theirs they've done it forever no revalidation no re, re um no um kind of uh no uh need for them to show that they um can have maintained their standard of practice you know generally speaking it's they have that qualification i have achieved that qualification that is there forever there may be optional cpd in some cases there is a licensing requirement subsequent to the qualification which is required for you to maintain the cpd but that generally means that you attend these learning courses um and you know you just if your attendance is essentially you don't necessarily have to show that your practice has either progressed or maintained in order to maintain your professional status you've had a qualification and that is a proxy that's given that's a proxy for expertise everybody knows that this is a limit this is limiting right because like i could forget most of what i've done on a training course um like two weeks later I mean, a lot of evidence a lot, lot of research about that from way back that how people forget most of it right so just go and start doing whatever i'm doing but nobody would ever come along and say actually no you're not maintaining your status you're not maintaining your professional standard you know you are not operating in line with your professional standard and if you don't have a mechanism to make sure that people are operating in line with their professional standard you the, the, in the end those professional standards become meaningless because otherwise like how you know anybody could just basically just do say that they're operating like that and they're not so fundamentally the shift of the whole of the whole industry particularly in the uk but going beyond that and any learning industry by the way is that any learning needs to be able to have a mechanism so that the individuals who've attend those learning experiences can evidence on an ongoing basis that they've not only maintained and and applied that learning in their context but also they can evidence how they are improving how they are showing that their learning is developing how they and then then they can be recognized for the expertise so if they want to become an advanced coach they become an advanced coach so <clears throat> Now the question you got is like well how do you do this right because at, at the at the scale we're talking about it's quite challenging well you, you definitely need to redeploy your workforce so at the moment there's a lot of people out there in coaching education who are referred to as tutors i mean that's really archaic language the notion of a tutor when i think of a tutor i think of somebody in a cap and a gown you know who is standing in front of a class of children and with you know with a cane in their hand and like and you know instructing right so this notion of tutor is quite an old word that we probably need to move away from um and so this idea of coach development and coach education <laughs> morning. Mm. um so this idea of coach education and coach development we've got to sort of shift our language a little bit and start talking differently but if we had this just deconstructed model um it could be quite an exciting approach so when i think of a deconstructed model i think like a uh, a posh uh lemon meringue pie that you'd get in a really high-end restaurant it's not a lemon meringue pie as we'd know it there's some there's a, there'll be like a, a pot and it'll have something like a lemon curd in it and then there'll be you know there'd be like a meringue um you know separate that's crumbled and it would probably be done three ways and then there'd be some sort of biscuit base and blah 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 you know what it's like um and you've got your own views as to whether that's a lemon meringue pie at all but that's like, so this is a similar concept. So you take everything that used to be packaged and you unpack it. So instead of learning happening in a finite period of time that's quite compressed and therefore suboptimal for the learner, we extend it over a lengthy period of time at, to be determined by the learner. So if I've only got an hour a week, to commit to my coaching or my whatever form of practice I'm involved in, that's fine. And if I've only got an hour a week to commit to sort of learning experiences, I can do that. And I can get those learning experiences from a load of different places. Um, and I can take those learning experiences along my developmental journey and I can sort of improve gradually and slowly. And then I can evidence my improvement separately so it's very much at my pace not at the pace that is set by the training provider who says you must be here at this day at this venue so then then so then there might need to be though if we're going you know we're doing our own learning in our own pace in our own time from a range of different sources there still needs to then be 
probably a moment in time where you can come together in a community of learning with others and uh, sh practice and get feedback from a knowledgeable individual as to whether you are understanding, assimilating and applying some of these ideas practically. That's really useful because that's really experiential. Then you'd need to go back in, probably gain some new knowledge because some of the insights that you've gleaned through your practice um, would then mean you need to re re relearn some things. Then you go and practice again in your own environment, wherever you're working. And then you go back in and, you, and, and it's a cyclical process, uh, often referred to as a spiral curriculum. And it's a cyclical process over a period of time that involves new knowledge, practical application, feedback, uh, peer learning, peer support, um, and then and then back in again. And you keep doing that. And at some stage, it, these individuals will have achieved some level of competence that could be recognised. And it could be really micro. So this notion of micro-credentialing and micro-learning. So you could just get these little micro, you know, kind of progression markers um, uh, that you then collect as you go. So the idea of qualification isn't necessarily that I've achieved this benchmark that's, you know, done with where we like plough everything into a very short period of time. We allow people to basically collect their, you know, their, their badges to show I have shown that I've understood this particular area and I understand what, understand what it means for me in application. And then you continue to do that. So the notion of continuous professional development isn't something done post-qualification. It's how you obtain what, whatever we call certification or, or professional status. You obtain your professional status and you maintain your professional status through an ongoing process of learning. And so that just becomes the norm. And this is true in professions. Professions do this. This is how they do it. Yeah, so you start off, you have a supervisor who is tracking your progress, is creating learning experiences for you, allowing you to have practical applications with supervision. So it's guided and supported and you progress and you progress and then you get to your level and then you get a level and you get certified and then you can move on and you maintain your certification. You know, and this is what the sports workforce needs to catch up with. This notion that I obtained some form of certification because I, intended, I attended a course and showed that I could remember some of it and that's going to be good enough for me forevermore, that can't happen anymore. It doesn't work. It doesn't work for them. It doesn't work for the participants because what you've got is minimally trained individuals who are then left to their own devices to do whatever it is that they think they're going to do. Right? And there's no requirement for them to revalidate their practice, which can lead to dire consequences for them and the participants. And this is about a better support system for the workforce. And if we get a better support system for the workforce, we get better outcomes for participants. And, and this is something that sports policy making has, has sort of just ignored for so long. You know, these people are seen as a means to an end. I'm putting some training into you to get an output out. You know, it's very behaviourist in its approach. But actually, let's treat these individuals with a better support system and get better outcomes for everybody involved. Our sport systems and our physical activity systems can thrive with better workforce development systems, which is one reason we're so passionate about it. Um, so, right, that's just a little snapshot. There's more to this, but I can't go on for too long. Uh, we're already at 23 minutes. Um, and um, I do, and, and, and if you want to go into more detail about actually how to unpack this and how to make this work, that's something that, you know, is probably going to take more of a one-to-one -one conversation, which again, as I said earlier on, I'm delighted to have with anybody. Um, and, you know, I'm available now to be able to do more of this kind of work, you know, take the kind of concept and the policy ideas and make them something that's real and practical. Anyway, so hope that's been of use. Uh, hope it sparked a few ideas. Please get in touch when you can. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. Like I said, twi uh, Twitter or LinkedIn are the best models, uh, the best places to find me. Um, or you can see me on uh, thetalentequation.co.uk. Stuart at thetalentequation.co.uk. Speak to you again soon. Bye-bye.